question. Welcome to our fifth Badger Crop Connect webinar of the 2023 season. Uh, I'm your host, Jerry Clark, uh, agriculture educator for the Division of Extension in Chippewa, Dunn, and Eau Claire counties. Uh, just a quick update from this part of the state. Um, had kind of a uh, little bit of whiplash this last week for some areas of our region. We've got uh, an excellent week for first crop uh, hay to get harvested, second crop just trying to struggle to come back a little bit. Um, we've also had uh, very dry weather over the last uh, three to four weeks, um, and we've had cover crop uh, termination. And this was a year where you saw that cover crop compete a little bit with the corn. So we've seen a pretty, uh, this uh, slide on the right is part of our research trials uh, here with a cover crop project. And um, you can kind of see the difference between uh, some of that uh, cover crop that uh, uh, has the, the corn crop a little bit behind uh, from the area that did not have the cover crop earlier. And then on the bottom left, uh, we've had quite a few irrigation systems running across uh, our area in this part of northwestern Wisconsin to keep the, uh, uh, the the soils moist. And we did pick up, in some cases of the area, about an inch of rain last Saturday. So we got a little relief, but uh, definitely need some more. Uh, most of us are aware of the uh, Zoom platform we're using, uh, so I'm just going to go through a couple housekeeping things. If you can keep your microphones off, uh, that helps with a little bit of the chatter in the background. Also, if you can keep your video off, that kind of helps those that maybe have a slow internet connection uh, from having issues and everyone can participate that at that point. If you have any difficulties with Zoom technology today, uh, for anything you uh, related, you can type your question into the chat box uh, for Sam Bibby. I think Sam's our wrangler today, so Sam will throw his information in the in the chat box. And as we uh, get started today, there will be a couple of poll questions that we, oops, went too far here, a uh, couple of poll questions uh, that will get launched here uh, shortly. And uh, just want some responses of where you're located in the part of the state. Uh, we're also going to have uh, some questions here related to uh, some issues that you're dealing with or uh, as we roll the Badger Crop Connect along. What are some of those issues that you'd like us to address uh, for the hour that we have uh, in the Badger Crop Connect series? So please participate in this poll uh, over the next uh, few minutes here uh, as we get started. Uh, so as we uh, as you complete that poll, uh, I'm going to stop sharing my slides and introduce our first speaker for today. And our first speaker today will be Dr. Emily Bick. Uh, she is a UW Madison assistant professor, uh, newly on board over the last uh, year here, and she's an extended fun funded faculty and en entomologist who will be talking to us today about some of the new rootworm developments uh, across the Midwest. So Emily, if you got a chance, you can, looks like your slides are coming through good and you can get started. Excellent, thank you so much for the introduction there. Uh, as Jerry mentioned, I'm Emily Bick. I'm a still very new uh, assistant professor of precision pest ecology for field and forage crops. Uh, I sit in the department of entomology and my background is purely entomology. So I do a lot of kind of high tech stuff. Um, today, I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about new developments in the corn rootworm across the Midwest, uh, kind of resistance, sensors, and the future. So before I dive into kind of resistance levels and, and the current state of the art with corn rootworm, I really need to talk about what we actually have going on in this state. Uh, we have two major species here, northern and western corn rootworm. Uh, occasionally we get some southern, but western is really uh, the, the primary issue in the state, with northern being the secondary issue. Uh, we have uh, eggs that are laid um, by adults the season before. They, these insects overwinter uh, as eggs in the soil. Uh, unfortunately, uh, due to uh, extended pesticide use, some of these eggs have something called extended diapause. So especially, uh, this is an especially an issue in Western corn rootworm. 
um, where the eggs actually hibernate for a couple seasons in a row, which means that even if we rotate, we can actually get around, or the insect can actually get around that rotation. Uh, the e eggs tend to hatch late May, early June, um, and are soil uh, dwelling larva, and they directly feed on the roots. We can see on the left over here, what that feeding actually looks like. Um, these nodes, sorry about that. The nodes are directly impacted, they're shortened. And for each node that's impacted, it's about a 15% damage um, increase uh, to, to those. The larvae have three instars and then they pupate in the soil before emerging as adults. The adults do some, some minor feeding, usually it's cosmetic and not economic. Um, and then they lay that next round for the next year with the Northerns having those extended diapause. Um, and the Westerns actually have learned to actually to lay eggs in two separate places, uh, both in cornfields, but in soybean as well. Okay, so that's where we are right now. Now, I have been invited to talk to a number of companies. Uh, in fact, the BIC lab is undergoing some testing uh, for major GMO traits and infero pesticide applications about resistance. And the main takeaway that I've had is companies are very concerned. Uh, they're very concerned about resistance. They're very concerned about their traits not working. Uh, trait stacking seems to be stacking some traits that they're known to not work with some new traits, which cause more resistance in the future. And a group of professors that I was part of uh, voiced some concern about this trait stacking. Um, however, there is some good news, and I announced this a little bit over the winter. Uh, the good news is, after many years of research, uh, it was found that there was actually a fitness cost to corn rootworm. Um, after a couple generations, maximum four, uh, you actually lose, the insect loses that resistance trait. So that's the good news. Uh, rotation works, especially if you rotate for four seasons in a row. Now, I know that's a that's kind of a hard pill for for practitioners to swallow. Um, but the bad news is there really is no rescue treatment, right? So if corn rootworm is in the soil, um, there isn't much we can do after planting. So what can we do? Well, we can reduce uh, corn rootworm by rotating uh, with other crops. Soybean probably isn't necessarily the crop as, as there's some egg laying in soybean for, for Western corn rootworm. And we can also trade, and we don't actually have to rotate off of corn. We can rotate different types of BT traits or different GMO traits year after year uh, in the same field. And that will help reduce that resistance. Now, I mentioned a little bit before this that uh, I tend to work in the digital space, right? So even though I'm an entomologist by training, I'm really trying to understand insects and translate that understanding into new tools and strategies uh, for data-driven precision practices. Um, I use this digital entomology term, which to me means sensors, models, and machine learning. Now, there are a whole range of kind of automated pest managing tools out there. There are sensors, there are optical, there are audio, there are cameras, there's LIDAR, so the use of lasers, there's smart traps and kind of open air microphones. And one of the things that I did a cup for a couple of years um, uh, ending when I, when I started this position was work on some of these traps with the major issue being these traps are really expensive. So the very first thing that I did after joining UW-Madison was start to develop a ridiculously cheap sensor a sensor that costs about $15 per unit. Now we're starting to explore it a little bit. Uh, the Brownfield News uh, was great this a uh, couple of weeks ago where they covered um, they covered the development of this sensor. Uh, Wharf uh, went ahead and patented it, which was awesome. And we're starting to figure out how to get a new type of very cheap sensor out to you guys by hopefully next field season. So what is the sensor and what is its capability? Well, we're basically using these things called clip-on microphones that clip directly onto a plant. Uh, there are a couple other parts. Right now we're running uh, kind of the computational part out of a Raspberry Pi, but we might do, we might put this onto a phone application at some point. Uh, we've got a sound card and uh, these are run through USB hubs. 
And basically we can clip this microphone onto a plant and start listening to what's happening in this plant. In this case, we can start listening to corn rootworm. So we tested this out a couple different ways. We wanted to test this out on, uh, on Lepidoptera and test it out on Coleoptera, so on moths and butterflies. We also wanted to test it out first on really large insects that aren't of particular interest to me because we can walk into the field and see these insects and then really small insects that are of extremely high interest because understanding if they're in their field and when they're in the field is really, really difficult. So the very first thing we did was we clipped uh, uh, these, these microphones uh, onto plants, onto two separate plants. One plant had an insect and one plant didn't have an insect. We tested this against large bodied insects. So in this case, tobacco hornworm is a you know, pretty, pretty sizable insect there. And then Colorado potato beetles, uh, we tested against the adult potato beetles, but uh, juvenile uh, tobacco hornworms. And then as soon as we had, we showed that these microphones were actually working, that they could uh, essentially eavesdrop on the chewing or the, the chomping of these insects with, and give it these very distinct signals. We started looking at really tiny insects. So European corn borer is an insect where from instar three through five, it feeds within the stem of the plant, so within the plant tissue. So to figure out if you have a European corn borer uh, larva, you actually have to take, I've heard people taking butcher's knives to corn plants and dissecting those plants in the field. Uh, it, it's not great because you could miss them, you could hurt someone. Uh, it's also not great because you lose the crop in that process. And then the second one, and I think the most exciting one, is listening to corn rootworms. Now we had a permit to listen to northern corn rootworms, but we've actually shown that we can do this in the field with western corn, what we think is western corn rootworms uh, right now. So we're undergoing that process as well. So what do we actually do? Well, you know, uh, experiments tend to go wrong a little bit. So the, the tobacco hornworms ended up on the court for the microphone. Uh, it took us a little bit to realize that the Colorado potato beetles were escaping their cages and to actually get the technique for injecting eggs of corn rootworms directly into the plant. But after a little bit of work, and well, I should say a lot of work on behalf of uh, uh, two people that worked in my lab and a little bit of work on my end, we are started to see very distinct signals between the large bodied insects and the small bodied insects, and actually between the, the species. So what we have over here is a recording of, or actually two sets of recordings per graph. We're recording for one hour intervals. We're recording on plants with and without an insect. So the way that you interpret this is plants without an insect are gray and plants with an insect are black. And that's all on one, one particular graph. Uh, we also wanted to show that we could do this on a wide range. So we looked at the Lepidopterans, the moths, which are tobacco hornworm and European corn borer, and the beetles, the Colorado potato, uh, potato beetle and the Northern corn rootworm. So moths and beetles and large bodied and small bodied insects. And what we found is first off, we could tell distinctly if there was an insect present or absent, regardless of what the insect was chewing on the plant. And then we started to dive in a little bit to species identification. And we're still working through some of the characteristics uh, of these sound recordings and if we can use just kind of very simple uh, extractions of those variables off of the recordings, or if we need to dive into more extreme machine learning pieces, that part is still in progress that, you know, essentially how do we use these waves to ID what's going on in the plant. But one of the exciting pieces is we ask the, the critical question of how long does a microphone need to be clipped on to find an insect? And with, this is basically a uh, hundred seconds where we sampled, um, I think it was 10,000 of, of our many, many recordings, our 304 hours of recordings. We sampled 10,000 for uh, Northern corn rootworm and for European corn borer. Uh, and we had a capture probability. So knowing an insect was there, how long did this microphone actually need to be on the plant? And the exciting piece here was 
if we kept the microphone on a plant for 20 seconds, we have an 80% likelihood of knowing it's there if it's European corn borer and a 90% likelihood or greater than 90% likelihood of knowing an insect is there if it is uh, for if we clip this microphone on for 20 seconds. And if we clip it on for 40 seconds, we have a 95% likelihood of knowing that a corn rootworm larva is actively feeding on the root zone of these plants uh, and a 90% likelihood for European corn borer. So what does that actually translate into, you know, number of insect bites or number of insect peaks? Well, if we extrapolate out that 40 second interval, which is relatively small, uh, we get something like we would have two bites on average in that 20, in that 40 second interval for European corn borers and four bites on average for corn rootworms. And this is Northern corn rootworms. Once again, we're, we're undergoing field tests right now. So that's pretty exciting. That means that this does not have to be a stationary tool set up in the field. Uh, this tool, which we've termed insect eavesdropper, that was actually one of my master's students that's termed it insect eavesdropper. Uh, it can be set up as a stationary tool, but it also means that it might be able to be set up as a essentially rambling tool or a mobile tool for someone to walk around, have one of these or a couple of these devices hooked up to a cell phone. We can press record an app for 40 seconds, run it through some sort of classification algorithm and at least know presence, absence and something about species ID. Um, once again, all very much in development. We have not cracked the code yet, but this is what we're, we're testing out this summer. So we wanted to test this out in the field. And luckily, uh, Sean Kepler and Natalia de Leon are corn breeders, and they have a field with a wide range of genotypes that they're testing out to see if any of these corn genotypes are resistant uh, to, to corn rootworm. So we set up five of these stations, the five of these sensors. Um, each sensor has eight microphones, and we have the sensor going just for for point of reference, we're having it going 120 seconds. So sorry, I'm, I'm, it's going for a minute 20. So essentially double 80 seconds, double the time that we estimated we would need to figure out if an insect is there or not. And about 70% of these microphones were reporting nothing. This is what nothing looks like. Uh, and the good thing about seeing that nothing is recorded is we can verify that down the line. We can actually check the root ratings and double check that these insects are really not present or they're really not chewing uh, on the plant at that time. The other really good thing is we were a little bit worried about noise. We were a little bit worried about how these microphones would handle being outside and not in a specialized soundproof sensor room where we did the earlier experiments. Uh, and it seems like the noise is actually lower than in the laboratory. So even though it was raining, it was windy, it was sunny, it was uh, a little bit hot during some of these signal times, we are not getting a tremendous uh, amount of background noise, which is great. That means that this, is, this tool is likely to be able to perform well in the field for future years. And then we started finding these insects. We first tested it out on we have a, a site number and a mic number. Keep in mind there are eight microphones per, per site. We first took a look at site one, mic one. And at 3 p.m. on the very first day, we got our very first insect signal. Now we set it up around noon. We, we got the signal around 3 p.m. And we first examined this plant to make sure that it didn't have any obvious biting or chewing or insects on it. It seemed like it did not. It, it had no obvious uh, insect feeding damage, which means that that damage likely came from feeding on the root zone, which was very exciting. But we wanted to confirm that this was actually a northern corn rootworm. So we checked out a different microphone at a different time at its same at the same site, and we found that 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 microphone was reporting feeding damage as well. Now, this is pretty exciting because in, uh, corn rootworm tends to be highly aggregated. The females are very selective in terms of where they lay their eggs. Where they lay their eggs, they lay a lot of eggs. 
and quite a few females will actually lay in a very uh, relatively small clustered space um, rather than across the whole field. So the fact that a neighboring plant with a different microphone clipped onto it uh, also showed feeding uh, was a very good sig uh, signal. We also, and I'm not presenting this data here, uh, we also showed that we could, um, that there's actually some circadian activity. There's some timing when this feeding happens. It seems to happen between nine and 11 and between, uh, uh, I think it was two and 4 p.m. We're not sure why. We tested out in the field and we took a look at that kind of microphone number one uh, at the next day, at the next time point that we thought that feeding would occur. And voila, site one, mic one at 9 a.m. the day after, site one, mic one at 3 p.m. was also showing that feeding damage. We went back and re-inspected all of these plants. So it seems like we are getting horn rootworm signals. Uh, we think it's probably Western rather than Northern given the location uh, in West Madison, but it seems like these sensors work really well outside um, and that they're picking up horn rootworm uh, outside. So very, very exciting for, for us. Um, so what's next? Well, we are, I hired in a second computer scientist in the lab and we're working up some insect IDing models, uh, whether we can do it through very simple characteristics as in how, uh, what, that, what that wave actually looks like, uh, what the frequency looks like, or whether we need to go into a little bit more kind of complicated machine learning algorithms to get to an insect identification from the signal. We're not sure, but it's something that we're, uh, we're looking into right now. Um, I also partnered up with a couple collaborators. So one in Kansas looking at a soybean borer, one in Iowa uh, looking at uh, insects that might be in the forage versus, or sorry, in the um, uh, just outside of, of, of the corn versus in corn in Washington, looking at leaf hoppers, um, in Alabama, looking at Hessian fly, in the United Kingdom, um, looking at uh, oh, what was it, cabbage stem flea beetle in oil seed rape or canola, and in Norway, looking at something very similar to see if we can train these models to actually identify pests across a whole range of cropping systems rather than just corn rootworm in uh, Wisconsin. Another big study that I have going on right now and we'll have results mid-July is trying to figure out if we can estimate the density of the insects. Can we tell how many insects are out there and based off of the, the frequency of these biting signals? Um, and can we correlate that with our existing root damage rating? So it's always very hard to, it's a lot of work, it's highly laborious to actually dig up the corn, uh, wash the roots and figure out what amount of damage was actually happening. So hopefully this type of tool will inform next year's planting. Um, and the, the last thing that we're playing around with right now is seeing, can we get something like this on a phone application uh, rather than on a Raspberry Pi that we have to walk around and it's a little bit uh, expensive. Now this work was done primarily by my, my postdoc, uh, Dr. Kimberly Gibson, uh, and by a computer science uh, rising master's student uh, Dev, and I'm really excited that Dev is staying around and continuing to, to help out with this work. Um, now, that was all I had on updates on corn rootworm, uh, but Josh, about five minutes before I saw, Josh emailed me and asked me to talk a little bit um, about true armyworm. Now, I've been hearing some uh, true armyworm uh, kind of grumblings coming up, and I'm, I reached out to the NPM program and talk to them about how to get, how, when I hear from you guys, how do I actually communicate that thus far? I've been doing so via Twitter or by radio shows, but I think I'm going to be using that NPM um, insect alert function pretty soon. Uh, so true army worms have immigrated. They do not overwinter here. They mostly do not overwinter here. They immigrate in from the South. Uh, they feed primarily on corn and grasses, though they also may impact small grains. And the treating threshold is if 50% of your corn seedlings are impacted and, and this is the really critical part, and the larvae are still small, then treating is merited. If the larvae are one inch uh, large, they're about to pupate, pesticides are not going to do anything. Um, 
anywho, that was my my very quick true army worm uh, update. And now uh, I'm opening the floor to any questions. Well, thank you, Emily. There's been uh, uh, one question and a couple of comments. So um, in the chat uh, here in the western part of the state, we have had some issues with alfalfa weevil on the on the regrowth of alfalfa. Uh, so any comments on alfalfa weevil or what you've observed or seen across the state? Yes. So in terms of alfalfa weevil, I've heard a little bit from PJ from people um, identifying alfalfa weevil. Um, there are some excellent guidelines that Brian Jensen put together and uh, are online on the UW extension page. And I'm happy to, to send a link out after this on thresholds. Um, from what I'm remembering correctly, uh, for alfalfa weevil, we need to make sure that we're using the right size net or we need to make sure that we're uh, as we're we're sweeping, we're doing a hundred sweeps from a couple different places um, across across the field, uh, and then I'm blanking right now on the actual threshold to treat. Um, but there is a, a threshold to treat that's established in the state. Uh, I think Brian helped establish that. Yeah, and then um, a question uh, regarding the. Uh, the technology you're working with, has it been tested in the field? Um, like does wind or other environmental factors imp yeah. impact the data, those kinds of that's a That's a fantastic question. And I'm gonna go back to this over here. So we have been testing this out in the field for about two weeks now. And it seems like wind does not impact the baseline signal and rain also does not impact the baseline signal. So that's that's really positive. Now the negative is it probably limits what these microphones can pick up on. I'm guessing, and we haven't tried it out, but I'm guessing non-chewing insects uh, would not be impacted by, uh, would not impact the signal here because what it, it seems like a, a chomp is actually needed to impact the signal. So it's it's good and bad that wind and rain don't seem to be impacting this this baseline. But we'll have a lot more data at the end of the season and try to spin out something really useful uh, for you guys next season. Great, interesting uh, approach, Emily. This is uh, kind, of, kind of interesting to see where this where this leads. It's it's pretty cool stuff. So uh, appreciate it uh, again, Emily. Going to stick around a little bit. If you get questions in the chat, uh, Emily will be here to answer them. And we will transition um, again. The poll um, is back up. Uh, regarded uh, some of the, oh, we're looking at the results, I guess. Um, so again, it's good to see that um, we got kind of a scattering across uh, the state today as far as where people are from. Um, uh, what kind of rain have we gotten since uh, Friday? Uh, looks like most are pretty much, well, kind of scattered across the state a little bit, but most are half inch or less, I guess, for the for the majority. But a few of us got lucky and picked up a, a little bit stronger thunderstorm. Uh, how worried are you, are you currently about the drought affecting your crops? Uh, most are in the worried section. Uh, some are not worried much, but uh, for the most part, again, I think it always, any of us in agriculture, we get a little worried when uh, the clouds stop dropping rain. And then we got, uh, we'll check out the, uh, the answers here later uh, as far as what topics you'd like to see uh, in the future. So. Appreciate that being shared with us today. Um, so with that, we're gonna transition over to Rodrigo Worley. He is our uh, extension funded faculty in agronomy, our weed scientist, mainly works with our uh, annual crop, cropping systems with corn and soybeans, but he's gonna talk to us a little bit about the post-emergence weed control options. So Rodrigo, looks like your slides are coming through good. Awesome, can you hear me well there, Jerry? Yep, yep you sound good. Awesome. All right, thanks for the intro. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. I gave a similar presentation this morning uh, during the University of Minnesota extension. A uh, few notes, uh, we'll see if we can cover uh, what's going on right now in the next 25 minutes. It's been a, a very challenging uh, season, and needless to say, I mean, the, the lots of questions as far as residual weed control and and what you do as far as post-emergence weed control goes. So I, I'll cover a lot of 
uh, topics here today, and I shared the link uh, to my presentation so you can download the slides and you can you know reach out directly to me later if you have uh, additional questions. Okay, uh, as I always like to start uh, thanking our team and our sponsors. Uh, we conduct applied research uh, to address the questions of uh, soybean and corn growers uh, in the state of Wisconsin. It's been really busy and this amazing team of academic staff and, and graduate students have been uh, nonstop uh, out there. And I would like to put a plug here and invite you all uh, to attend our giant ragweed management field day, which will take place tomorrow, uh, June 15th at the Rock County Farm. Okay, so we're gonna start with registration at nine o'clock. Uh, the field day will go from 9.30 to 11.30, and then we're gonna serve uh, lunch, uh, brought lunch afterwards, and we can you know, use that opportunity to catch up with each other and discuss uh, what's going on out there. So again, just would like to remind you and also invite you to attend our giant ragweed management plot tour tomorrow, uh, June 15th, Thursday at the Rock County uh, Farm. And if you're not familiar with the Rock County Farm, uh, the field day is going to start. Here's the Rock County Jail, uh, Highway 14. We're right on the north side of the road there where we're going to start our field day. Okay. So hope to see most of you there uh, tomorrow if you're able to join us. Here's uh, the outline of my presentation. And during this presentation, what I'm going to try to do is to briefly address the main questions I have received over the past uh, four weeks. Uh, the, the first one being, okay, dry springs, what's happening with the pre-emergent herbicides uh, that I applied uh, at planting? Uh, you know, some of the considerations for corn and soybean post weed control. I've been traveling around the state uh, this past week here, seeing a lot of rigs. I, I think we're coming pretty close to being done uh, with post-emergence applications in corn. Uh, a lot of corn fields being treated. And I think, you know, if we haven't started, we're going to be shifting into our soybean fields here uh, pretty soon. One thing that I want to say as we think about post-emergence weed control, uh, we've been pretty dry. I don't need to uh, say that, right? And when you have dry conditions, the weeds that are up and going, they have been really stressed, okay? So they have really thick corticals. Uh, they're going to be challenging to control. So when spraying a post-emergence or a foliar-based uh, herbicide program, uh, you know, keep in mind the application technology parameters, the right tip, uh, the right carrier uh, rate, you know, the better coverage, uh, the better off you are, and also the role of adjuvants. When the weeds are stressed, uh, we got to make sure we're putting our adjuvants to work uh, so our adjuvants help our herbicides be more effective. So let's just make sure that we're spraying, uh, you know, under the best case scenarios to optimize herbicide performance under the stressed weeds that we have growing out there. And then the last thing I'm gonna to try to cover here today is the potential carryover concerns uh, for the next uh, growing season, depending on what we do uh, this year and depending on what happens as far as precipitation goes in the next months. The first thing is uh, pre-emergent herbicides. I think we've all made tremendous progress as far as adopting uh, pre-emerge herbicides go. Uh, and I think we all stand behind a recommendation. I think we got to start clean. We got to stay clean. We got to take advantage of our good pre-emergent herbicides. They are foundation for weed control. Okay. And I've been using this slide for the past five years. Uh, some of you have seen it. If not, all of you have seen the slide. Uh, however, they're not bulletproof, right? And we have some concerns here. And one of the concerns as far as, uh, you know, effective use of pre-emergent herbicide goes and effective weed control with pre-herbicides is the need for timely activation, okay? We need rainfall. Uh, these herbicides, they need to get into the soil uh, to be uh, effective. And unfortunately, this year, some of the crops that were planted a little later, they haven't received uh, rainfall, so there hasn't been a whole lot of activation of pre-emergent herbicides, okay? And that's been the main challenge uh, this growing season. And this challenge is not happening only here in Wisconsin. This is the latest version of the U.S. drought monitor. I just downloaded it uh, last night. What's happening here in Wisconsin is happening throughout the corn and soybean uh, producing region uh, of the country, okay? So these questions that I've been getting as far as efficacy of freeze go, all my counterparts in the other states are also uh, dealing uh, with, okay? So some general observations from our research trials, the crops that we planted late April, uh, early May, those crops got a little bit of rain, uh, following planting 
and following those pre applications, those crops, surprisingly, they look really, really good, right? Joe Lauer says, you know, little drier conditions in the spring will help the crops put roots down. We're definitely seeing that uh, with the corn that was planted early May and also the soybeans, okay? Our early crops are fine. Uh, they got some, some rain uh, to get that pre-emerged herbicide program into the soil. So overall things are still okay. Where we're seeing the biggest challenges are the crops that were planted mid-May, a little later May. Uh, that top soil has been really, really dry. Uh, we're getting uneven crop establishment and so on. So those are the crops that we're going to have to keep a really uh, close eye uh, on just because of the, the circumstances that this uh, later established crops have experienced since going in the ground. So here's uh, what happens uh, with pre-emergent herbicides. I think it's important uh, to discuss this. Uh, Pre-herbicides are fantastic for uh, integrated chemical weed control. Uh, once sprayed into the soil, you need rainfall to get that herbicide. And once that herbicide in the soil, you need that soil to stay wet uh, so that herbicides remain in soil solution, okay? So if you spray and, and there's no rain to incorporate that herbicide, the herbicide is gonna be sitting on the soil surface. And even if there is an activating rain following an application, but then it gets really dry, the herbicide is gonna be sorbed uh, to the soil. It's not gonna be in soil solution, okay? So for priests to work, not only you need rainfall to get them into the soil, but you also need that soil to remain wet so the herbicide stays in soil solution, okay? Which hasn't been uh, the case this year for us given the, uh, the dry conditions. And on top of all that, uh, we're also adopting cover crops, right? So not only now uh, we have this herbicide seeding on soil, but we also have uh, some cases where we have this herbicide seeding for some extra time uh, on cover crop residue, which makes this uh, dynamics a little more complicated, okay? But one aspect or two aspects that I really want to discuss today uh, is the volatility aspect, okay, of this pre-herbicides and then the photolysis, okay, or the breakdown uh, by light, okay? So those are the main concerns, especially for herbicides that have been sprayed and haven't seen a whole lot of rain uh, to activate them, okay? So this is a really neat article that was put together uh, by Dr. Bob Hartzler. He's a weed scientist, former weed scientist, extension weed scientist at Iowa State University. He retired recently, but in 2020, he wrote this article. In 2020, uh, we also observed a dry spring. It was pretty dry in Iowa, and then he put this article out there, and the title of the, war, the article is, What's Happening to My Prees on the Soil Surface, okay? And when the, the pre-herbicides are on the soil surface, just like I described, the two main factors impacting their fate is the volatility and their photodegradation. And Dr. Hartzer put together this really neat table that you see on the right side of this slide here, and he's got multiple columns. So here we have the herbicides, so these are the common molecules that we're using in corn and soybean production systems. These are their herbicide groups, okay? And this is an indicator of volatilization, their vapor pressure. The larger the number, the higher the chance for volatility, okay? So we have here uh, eradicane as an example of a highly volatile herbicide, okay? The highest number you can see here. The next one is gonna be trifluralin, okay? And then the smallest number that you're gonna see in this table here, it's gonna be for safofenacil. Okay, so in parentheses here, he's got the exponent value of that uh, VPA number. And the smaller that number, uh, the less volatile that product is. And the rule of thumb here, if it's smaller than three, usually we don't have a lot of concerns as far as volatilization goes. So my point with this here is that most herbicides, they are not highly volatile. Most of the herbicides that we're currently using are corn and soybeans, they're pretty stable. And they're pretty stable as far as volatilization go, but also as far as photodegradation goes, okay? One that's a little more prone to photodegradation and volatilization is going to be esmetolachlor right here. But all the other common components that we use, they are pretty stable. Rodrigo, where are you going with this? Well, we sprayed some herbicides three, four weeks ago, and we have received very little rain, okay? Those molecules, they tend to be pretty stable, so they're probably still sitting on the soil surface. And as we've just started to catch some rain here, you're gonna see those herbicides getting activated and they're gonna start acting on weed control, okay? So the herbicides just sprayed a while back, now they're gonna start kicking in and they will provide some residual control. It's not all loss, okay? And that's because this formulations of those products that were currently used, they tend to be pretty stable, okay? So with that, I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna talk about a trial that we have conducted at the Rock County Farm uh, for the past 
uh, two seasons where we compared multiple soil residual programs for giant ragweed control. And we had two years there. Uh, 2021 was more of a normal year as far as precipitation goes. So within the first uh, 15 days of planting and spraying our prees, we got uh, almost two inches of rain. Okay, so that was pretty good. However, last year, if we recall, we also had some dry spells in the spring. And that's what happened here at Janesville. We planted our corn crop on May 11th and we sprayed our prees. Uh, but in the first two weeks, we had less than an inch. Okay, 21 millimeters is less than an inch. So we didn't have a whole lot of rain uh, last year. And that had some interesting impacts uh, on our results. And where I'm going with this, the common question that I get is how much rainfall is necessary to activate our prees? Uh, the answer, just like for most agronomic uh, management decisions is depends, right? But the rule of thumb is if the soil is already wet, you need about half an inch, okay? Now, if you're starting with a dry soil, three quarters of an inch is usually ideal. And then some recent research that was published looking at very rich data sets, uh, what this authors from Illinois have found is that usually if you have two to four inches of rain within the first two weeks of planting your crop and spraying your pre-emergent herbicide, this is when you get the best activation and residual control prees, okay? So in an ideal world, within 15 days from planting, two to four inches is ideal to activate and assure that that herbicide uh, stays in soil solution, uh, controlling weeds as they emerge, okay? So now I wanna move to the results. Uh, comparison between 2021, which is a wetter year compared to 2022, which is a drier year. And you see the separation of results there, okay? And what you're gonna see for the most herbicides on top here, providing the best levels of control are standard programs that contain three active ingredients, okay? So mixing multiple active ingredients is a recommendation uh, for resistance management, especially when you think about post-emergence weed control. But when you switch to pre-emergence herbicides, you know, having multiple active ingredients is important for resistance management, but you got to remember that those herbicides, each component has a different dynamic in the soil surface. So by having multiple AIs sprayed at once, you will assure a higher chance of controlling weeds because the conditions there will likely be ideal for one, not necessarily the other, okay? And that's why having multiple AIs there early on can really help extend residual weed control. One thing that was really surprising, and we've been talking about this, we're going to talk about that during the field day tomorrow. If you look on the right side on the dry spring, Diflex, okay? So using Dicamb as part of a pre-program, when it's a really dry spring, and we're observing this now for the third year in both corn, but also in extend soybeans, having Dicamb as part of the pre-program can really help residual control during dry springs. What are you saying, Rodrigo? Well, if I'm going to be spraying a pre, and I'm not seeing any rainfall in the forecast for two weeks. If I have, you know, if I'm going with corn or if perhaps if I'm, if I have extended soybeans, I would consider adding uh, dicamba as part of that pre, just so it, that dicamba would take care of the weeds that will be emerging until enough rainfall comes to activate the other herbicides. Okay. So this is something that we've learned with our research here in the past few years, and we'll discuss more during the field day. So now I'm done talking about pre-emergence uh, residual weed control. I'm going to switch into post-emergence weed control. Those pictures were taken uh, from our plot at uh, Rock County Farm, and they were taken uh, uh, two days ago. Okay, and what you're going to see here, this plots had a pre. Uh, you know, they're a lot less weedy than the check plots are, but the weeds are coming through. And what you're seeing in those plots are primarily, you know, giant ragweed, uh, which can come from down below. The giant ragweed can emerge three inches in depth where there's plenty of soil moisture, that giant ragweed just keeps on coming, okay? But what's been really surprising is one thing that I want folks to pay attention to is the grass. The grasses are coming through the roof uh, right now, okay? Uh, so large cedar broad leaves, the annual grasses are emerging and they're growing fast. The one thing that we haven't seen a whole lot yet is water hemp. So we noticed water hemp started to emerge early May after the early showers we had, but because we've been so dry, even water hemp is not emerging right now. Okay, but with the recent rains that we just caught here, I'm anticipating this water hemp will soon explode. Rodrigo, what you're saying? Well, we got to be very strategic because we have this large seeded weeds and the grass is growing. We need to control them. A water hemp hasn't started fully emerging yet. So we need to be very strategic how we go about this post emergence and this layered residual control for uh, water hemp. Okay, 
The other thing that I just said is grasses, uh, particularly in corn. That's been a very common question this past three, four days. Rodrigo, I have grasses going in my non-GMO corn. What are the main options to control them? Uh, and that's a really good question. It's a complicated scenario. The three herbicides that we've seen some really good uh, results from, especially when the grasses are still small, are nickel sulfuron or Accent. Uh, the next one is going to be Laudis or Timbotrion. And then the third one, uh, it's going to be Armazon or Topremazon. Okay. So the three molecules, uh, nickel sulfuron, uh, Timbotrion, or Topremazon, this herbicides that contain these products, they have done a decent job uh, suppressing grasses. I'm not going to say full control because it's just, you know, without glyphosate, it's hard to get full control post-emergence in corn. But the three molecules, if, if sprayed accordingly, they can help. Uh, with grass control post-emergence in conventional corn. So I just wanted to toss uh, that out there. And then moving now into post-control uh, of our corn, soybeans, you know, water, hemp, and giant ragweed growing out there. As you all know, we have several options, effective options uh, for giant ragweed. This is what the figure on the right shows you here. And soybeans is going to be more complicated, especially the water, hemp post-control, okay, uh, because of all the resistance issues uh, that we're seeing out there. Even the herbicides associated with the trays when sprayed alone, for instance, you know, in list one, uh, dicamba here and glufosinate, they don't go beyond that 90% control in our bare ground uh, trials here. So these herbicides that are the, the most effective, they're associated uh, to the traits that we have out there. And if folks are growing either non-GMO uh, soybeans, or if they, if they have Roundup Ready only soybeans, then the PPOs become the main options, okay, being Cobra and Flexstar, the, the best performing uh, herbicides, okay? So just wanted to show this data out there, and hopefully this, this results here can help you uh, support your decisions uh, for post control. The one thing that we've learned uh, over this past couple of years uh, is enlist, about enlist performance in water hemp is to avoid spraying when it's uh, very hot out there, okay? So if, if conditions are really hot, if temperatures are you know around the 90 degrees, uh, I would avoid spraying in list. Uh, we observe better performance when we spray in list post-emergence to water hemp. Uh, when the temperatures are around you know the, the low 80s, uh, mid 80s, we tend to get better results. I know sometimes it's difficult to control that, but if you want to enhance performance, avoid spraying when it's incredibly hot, okay? That way you get better water hemp control with enlist herbicide in our in your enlist soybean systems. Now I want to switch and I want to talk glufosinate. And for glufosinate, the situation is the complete opposite than enlist. Glufosinate really likes the heat. So whenever spring life or glufosinate, you want to make sure you have high temperature, plenty of sunshine. Okay, that's going to enhance control post-emergence of water hemp with glufosinate or Liberty. We've been also conducting tank mix research. Uh, with glufosinate to enhance its efficacy, okay? And we've done this research for two years now. We have six site years of data. And the story is really neat here. I know those figures are small, so I'll just kind of walk you through the results. But what we're learning is when we mix glufosinate with a PPO inhibitor herbicide, we tend to optimize control, okay? So spraying glufosinate with Cobra, glufosinate or Liberty with Flexstar, or glufosinate uh, Liberty with a resource, we're seeing better control than just spraying glufosinate by itself or the PPOs by themselves. Okay, so putting the two, uh, you know, herbicides together, uh, optimizing water hemp control. The first question that I get then, okay, Rodrigo, but what about crop response? And that's a very fair question. Uh, what we've learned over three years of uh, research here is every time you have cobra or lactophane in that tank, you're going to see significant level of uh, crop injury, okay? So if you don't like seeing the crop injury that Cobra brings, and it doesn't matter if you're doing Cobra by itself or Cobra with glufosinate, the injury is about the same, okay? Mixing the two does not increase injury compared to Cobra by itself. So if you don't like seeing that injury, uh, the two other options to be mixed with Liberty uh, would be Flexstar uh, or Resource that could provide really good water hemp control, just like I described, without, you know, without causing a whole lot of crop Injury. You still see some, but not to the same extent as Cobra uh, would cause. And then the last thing that folks ask, okay, other than the, the crop response, what about yield? 
And six years of data here, we have not impacted crop yield. Okay, even with that cobra causing a lot of injury, uh, soybeans tend to be just fine. I mean, they'll you'll slow down how fast they close canopy. Okay, but at the end of the season, uh, no yield impact uh, with the tank mixtures we're seeing. So I'm not telling you go out there and you use this tank mix combinations for every single acre uh, that you have that you intend to uh, spray glufosinate. But if you're coming up against a tough pressure of water ham, you may want to consider giving that glufosinate an extra help. And a good way to do so is by tank mixing it uh, with a PPO inhibitor herbicide. Okay. And then what I like to ask, you know, today I focused a lot on chemical weed control. What other options are out there? Uh, I was driving uh, to Arlington uh, last week, and then on my way there, I just saw Farmer Dennis here. I stopped and talked to him a little bit. Uh, he had just spreaded some urea, and then he was incorporating that urea, and while he was incorporating urea, he was also killing some weeds, okay? And this week, uh, Mr. Dennis here was planning on getting his post control applied to the corn, so he's going to be treating a lot less plants. So this might not fit every single field out there, but that's an option, right? We have a lot of weeds out there. Uh, you know, there's other ways we can help, uh, you know, our chemical weed control programs as well. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, carryover concerns. That's always uh, a concern, right? Uh, what I'm spraying this year, how is that going to impact my crop? Next year, make sure you're paying close attention to the labels as you make uh, applications. Uh, the two main herbicides that we often see uh, causing carryover uh, are mesotrien and fomazafen. So the mesotrien, you're spraying to your corn crop this year. Uh, be mindful of the amounts uh, that you can spray. Uh, I, I know mesotrien is pretty affordable out there. There's a lot of generic versions. So it, it's pretty much going in every single application in corn. But let's watch the rates. Because if we overuse the mesotrien and then if we have an overall dry season and you rotate into soybeans next year, that's, that can be very concerning. And then the next one, is going to be in our soybeans if we rely on Fomazafen or Flexstar uh, to help uh, with post, you know, weed, uh, broadly weed control post emergence in soybeans. Be mindful uh, of that 10 month interval between that application and planting your corn. So don't, don't go too late in your soybeans with Flexstar because if you remain dry uh, next year, we may have Fomazafen carry over into corn, which can be very, very uh, problematic. So those are the two things I want to bring to your attention. Uh, today as you make decisions here as far as post-emergence weed control goes. So I covered uh, a lot of topics here today. Uh, I just want to do a quick recap. Freeze are important. They're going to continue to be important. And unfortunately, this year, because of the dry conditions, uh, they're not working as uh, we wish they were, but they're still going to be very important. They're still sitting on that soil surface. And if we continue to get rain here, they're going to be controlling the weeds that are emerging uh, now, okay? Uh, pay close attention uh, to your application parameters. Uh, the weeds are stressed. Uh, your herbicides can use all the helps, uh, all the help uh, to control those weeds post-emergence. Okay, whether that's a car higher carrier rate, adjuvant, nozzle selection, uh, and so on. And then watch the labels and make sure you stay within limit of maximum application rates of each herbicide here, so we minimize potential carryover into the next growing season. So with that, I want to thank you uh, for uh, for your attention, and I'll have uh, five minutes here, or so hopefully to entertain some questions, Jerry. Sure. Um, one question came in, Rodrigo, um, is uh, if farmers respray their uh, put a respray to uh, reapply a herbicide because of the the, the activation wasn't there. Is that the, do you still add that accumulative amount, you know, for the season? Does that still count or did you lose so much that you can still do a full rate or stay, what stay or not a full rate, but stay within the season, you know? Yeah, that, that's a good, that is a good question. Uh, Jerry, you got to stay within that season quantity and what's on that soil surface is not lost or gone. If we get rain here, it's still going to be activated. It's hard to say whether we have 70% of that product still lying on soil surface 80 or 50, but you know, some of it, if not majority of it, is still on that soil surface. This is especially the more modern products we have out there, they're pretty stable uh, in the environment. And that's why when we have dry years like this, you know, you see high chances for carryover just because of how stable those herbicides are to volatility and photodegradation. Okay. 
So if, if somebody sprayed one X, don't come back and spray another one X of the same product because uh, that can become problematic. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions at this time. Um, so what we will do is kind of move into wrapping up here. Um, Rodrigo and Emily are still on board. So if you have a question, uh, please throw it in the chat or uh, raise your hand or unmute your microphone. We can do that. Um, Sam has put the QR code up for today's uh, CCA number. If there is, so you can scan that code. If you can't do the scanning, um, we'll put a link in the chat box.